Good evening. My name is Janelle Riley. I'm the film and TV editor of Backstage. I want to thank you so much for coming out for this SAG Foundation conversation with the cast of Warrior. Uh, this is simply one of the best movies of the year. It's a terrific accomplishment from writer-director Gavin O'Connor. And we are so fortunate to have some members of the cast here with us tonight. Uh, first, please join me in welcoming a fantastic actor you might remember from such series as The Gates and Prison Break. He also appeared previously in O'Connor's film Pride and Glory. And in Warrior, he plays loyal trainer Frank Campana. Please welcome Frank Grillo. <laughs> Also joining us, we have the lucky lady who gets to work with all these amazing men. Uh, you know her from the TV show's house, and of course the best new show of the season, Once Upon a Time. Well, why aren't you watching it right now, if you're that excited? It's, it's, it's on right now. Um, anyway, she is simply a revelation as Brendan's wife, Tess, in Warrior. Please welcome Jennifer Morrison. Uh, finally, I'd like to introduce the gentleman who is so heartbreaking as the estranged father, Patty Conlin, in the film. Uh, I don't even know where to begin. His varied credits include the award-winning miniseries Rich Man, Poor Man, films as varied as 48 Hours and Cape Fear. He's received Oscar nominations for his work in Prince of Tides, should have won, and <laughs> <laughs> Affliction. And perhaps most importantly, he was one of People Magazine's Sexiest Men of the Year. Please welcome him. Wow, sexiest, you were one of the sexiest men of the year? I didn't know that. I, I, Recently? I, it was a mistake. It was a terrible mistake. I, I always said it, it, it should be Walter C Cronkite. And uh, he didn't want it. So. so you were the second choice. Uh, in my mind, that's what I thought. Uh, thank you all so much for being here tonight. Um, my mic seems to be cutting in and out, so I might just be projecting instead. Um, congratulations on a beautiful film. Uh, okay. How's that? Nope, this one's broken too. <laughs> it's me. Maybe if I turn it on? There we go. Yeah. <laughs> I have a film degree in telecommunications. It's a scary thing. <laughs> Uh, again, thank you guys so much for being here today. Um, I just want to start at the beginning. How did the script for Warrior find its way to you, and, and what drew you to your respective roles? I think it came to Nick first. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it might have. I don't know. Uh, it, um, uh, Gavin said he was working on something, uh, and he, he said, I'm, we're going to write it for you. Uh, the father's role, and uh, I said, well, when you finish it, let me read it. So that's how I got it, and, uh, and it was just a wonderful script. Uh, I remember I was, uh, the dynamics of the family were so strong in, in all the areas, uh, but I wasn't, um, I didn't know anything about MMA, mm -hmm. you know, and I, I just really didn't, the violence just didn't uh, appeal to me too much. Uh, so I said, called Gavin, and I said, boy, this is a great script. You know, it's just it's fantastic. But do we really have to do the MMA thing? <laughs> <laughs> the movie would be five minutes. <laughs> yeah. He said, yeah, we do. He said, he said, I know what you mean. He said, but look, you'll meet these guys. You'll meet their friends. You'll meet their wives. You'll meet their mothers. And you'll meet their fathers. And you'll see that these guys are just regular human beings. They're not out to be the tough guy or this kind of thing. This is just something they've gotten into that, that is a, a sport, an art to them, and many different disciplines of fighting. So uh, I did meet him and, and, and changed my mind a lot, you know. So that's how I got the script. Uh, 
Aren't you and Gavin neighbors, or you live very close to one another? Yeah, he lives down the block a little bit. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I was quite surprised. I mean, I was in, supposed to be in Gavin's first film, and I walked that two weeks before we were to start. We'd been together for about a year, and uh, uh, for a multitude of reasons, but I left, um, I left a message on his answering machine just saying, uh, you know, Gavin, yeah, I can't go on with the film. I'm, I've got to go get my knee replaced. And um, he kept that message, and he, you know, click it out. <laughs> Let me listen, lets me listen to it. I was on that movie, yeah, and yeah, when right. Nick left. <laughs> and and I, I saved the message that Gavin called me about you. <laughs> so if you ever want to hear that message. <laughs> I'm up to hearing everything now. <laughs> yeah. Now, Frank, you, because you did work on Pride and Glory with yeah, Gavin. Yes, that's how I met him. Did uh, he approach you early on about the role? Yeah, I, mean, uh, I did the movie that Nick is talking about, Pride and Glory. And, uh, and Gavin, I, I was a fan of boxing and still am and, and MMA. And he knew it, and he called and said, you know, I have this thing. I, the, it, the, the role's not really flushed out yet. I'll send you the script. Let's kind of talk about it. And it just evolved from there. Yeah. Were you, uh, did you have any idea what the role was going to be? Were you yeah, I, mean, I, you... Knew, I knew it was going to be uh, uh, the coach of whoever was going to, you know, play. Eventually, Joel Edgerton, who wasn't cast at the time. But I knew it was going to, you know, be the, the dynamic was the the other side of what Nick was, and, and so I was, I was excited to try and work with Nick again. <laughs> <laughs> and he stuck it out. <laughs> Did we even rehearse? <laughs> was, were you at the reading when I was? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, Jennifer, uh, Gavin actually says this never happens, or this has never happened to him before, but you were the third actress he saw on the first day of casting your role and after you came in, he said, that's it. We don't need to see anyone else. What did you do in that room? <laughs> well, I really can't talk about that. <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> I, gosh, I don't know. I, uh, I mean, I had read the script and um, was working on House at the time and was really looking to do just, I really wanted to put something in my hiatus that year because I really wanted to do something that was, as different from Cameron as possible, and um, loved the script, and and um, immediately connected with Tess. And it, I, for me, like when I read scripts, I always feel like sometimes I read them for the character that I'm supposed to read for, or that I'm being offered, and I think, uh, okay, I can see a way in. And sometimes I read them, and I immediately see myself as them. And that was one of those scripts where, I, I, as I read the script, I saw myself as Tess immediately. So I, I instinctively had a really strong connection to the character. Um, and uh, I don't know. I, I mean, I just instantly got along with Gavin and Anthony Tabakis, who was the writer, and he, they were both in the room, and um, I felt completely at home and comfortable with them, and Gavin is such a generous director. It was like, you know, instead of going into a room and they don't really tell you anything and you have no idea what happened, he offered so much information and so much direction in the room, and, and it, just, it, it felt like I was making the movie right away with them. It didn't feel, there was no, we didn't sort of skip a beat with each other, so. Uh, apparently, I, I, it didn't end up in the movie, but originally there was a scene where I had to tell off the principal about um, put, laying off Joel's character for a while, and I don't remember what I said. They asked me to ad lib that, and apparently I was pretty <laughs> uh, intense. <laughs> and then I, I, yeah, I don't know. I think that's what won them over, my swearing at the principal on the phone. Um, I, so I guess just don't make me mad. <laughs> And how familiar were you guys with the world of mixed martial arts fighting? There's 5,000 interviews online about how much I've watched mixed martial arts. <laughs> I feel like, <laughs> like I've spent my life answering that question. Um, no, it's, uh, I mean, I watched fights and stuff. Yeah, I, I mean, I went and lived with them for two months. I went to New Mexico and lived with this guy, Greg Jackson, who's, I guess, the best MMA coach in the world. And, all the top champion George St. Pierre's of the world are at this place. And I lived there for two months and learned about Did you about meet St. Pierre? Yeah, and he's very attractive. He's hot in person. <laughs> <laughs> he's very attractive. He's got a beautiful he's mouth. <laughs> no. He's amazing. <laughs> no, he's amazing. But you, know, these, but, you know, Nick is right. These guys are very, they're all, they're all very educated. They're all gentlemen. They're all, you know, they, 
they, they learn about Beethoven like in the film, they learn you know, about classical music and string theory and all kinds of weird, you'd never associate a fighter with these, the process that they went through. And, uh, and so I learned a lot about MMA that way, just being around them. Yeah. Do you think your initial uh, perceptions of what MMA was changed after working on this film? Uh, mine, mine have, so, certainly. I mean, you know, these, these guys, what they do is, uh, you know, they train 10 hours a day. And, you know, I mean, it's in, they are in the best condition I've ever seen an athlete be in. Yeah. It's, it's really, and the mental capacity to get into a ring for that long with, with guys of equal, you know, uh, um, strength and, and experience, it, it's, it blows me away. I mean, it really, I thought I was a decent athlete, and <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> You know, there's uh, so many disciplines involved in in the MMA. You got you have your, uh, your wrestling is a, a big, strong tra tradition of it, and many of those guys come out of uh, AAU wrestling in colleges and from Iowa or my my Oklahoma, and some of the college wrestlers go on in the MMA, and then they've got to pick up boxing. You know, and, and boxing in itself has its own little world, which MMA doesn't have that. So that that's a big difference. Where whereas boxing in isolation kind of has some corruption to it, you you don't have that so much in MMA because you've got so many disciplines, and then you have all the uh, Eastern disciplines which get into meditations and all sorts of stuff. But uh, overall, it's it's a a form of uh, neighborhood wrestling that we kind of grew up doing, every one of us, you know, that we would have in the neighborhood, you know. And uh, it's cut that kind of carry on, that it's a neighborhood fight, you know, that's not gonna get too serious, you know. And I don't think there's as much injury in MMA as there is in boxing, yeah. because you're taking blows to the head so constantly. Yeah. They have, you know, knockout holds, special holds that put people out. I mean, you know, it's really tricky stuff. You got a leg and an arm jammed up your throat, and, <laughs> and the guy passes out and taps out and stuff like that. It looks violent. It really looks yeah. violent. Uh, but, you know, it's, I think it's going to become more popular than boxing in its own way. After this movie, I suspect it will. <laughs> Mine. Um, Nick, the character of Patty, he, he's faced a lot of struggles that sort of reflect your own life. Um, and I know Gavin was very aware of that when he wrote the part for you. Did that, <laughs> did, you'd be very open about that. Did, did that make you hesitate to take the role or were you sort of eager to embrace that opportunity? You know, I was once asked by um, Jack Black said to me, he says, how, how do you be a football player and become an actor? And I said, well, you know, it didn't work that way, Jack. I did a football movie, and then I became a football player. <laughs> uh, so, you know, uh, yeah, well, with Patty, you know, the thing with Patty is, is not the fact that he drank. It's the fact that he, he, he got obsessed on his winning, and he lived his life through his boys. And in doing that, he drove his boys away from him. And, uh, and then with the, with the alcohol on top of it, you know, it just makes it a real problem. And what he's done to the son, and why they're so mad, is because I, the way I pictured it is three Christmases ago, he, he came over drunk and drove the car right into the living room, you know and almost killed the kids, and so. Did you I, discuss that with Gavin no, and the family? No, I kept that a secret. Oh, yeah. <laughs> then how if, did I know? Well, you see, I didn't want to tell you guys, because you were mad enough, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't want to have a big sit-down conversation about it, because those things get, then you try to make it logical and it never fits, mm -hmm. you know? So it's best just to keep a secret, you know? Jennifer, did you have an idea in your mind what happened? I feel like maybe you did tell Gavin or something, because I feel like Joel and I did discuss that being what happened. The reason for the estrangement? Yeah. Yeah, what was it? That, that you drove the car into the living room. Uh, because, uh, because we kept saying it had to be something so bad 
Yeah. It had to be something bad enough that you'd really feel like your family was in danger. It couldn't just be inappropriate behavior or something that was yeah. easily forgiven. Because there's so much you can forgive when you love people and, and you know that family members are going through something difficult. But for it to be something that we, we took such extreme action on and mm -hmm. feeling that our children weren't safe, it had to be something that extreme. You know? Yeah, that's, that's the worst I've ever heard in an AA meeting. It was, oh, it's a true story. It, yeah, yeah. Some old guy said, you know, I always went down at 6 o'clock to have my cocktails down at this bar uh, down at the bottom of this hill. And uh, he said, one night I was down there and I had my drinks. I came up and I missed my turn and went down the backyard of my friend's house and right into his living room and just missed his daughter's room. And he said, uh, then that's the day I went to AA. He said, I think I got a problem. So I just lifted that story from him. <laughs> um, Jennifer, one of the things I love most about the character of Tess is I feel like in, in most films of this genre, you either have sort of the nagging true wife mm -hmm. or the saint who is so patient and understanding. Mm -hmm. um, were you sort of aware of those tropes? And, and how did you avoid falling into that trap? Yeah, I was very aware of it, and um, it was interesting because the version of the script that I read when I originally uh, auditioned for the role, uh, Tess was very sick. She had she had a heart condition, which was sort of the justification for why she'd be upset about him fighting because she felt like we can't orphan our children. You know, mm -hmm. God forbid if anything happened to you. So I really kind of understood that perspective. And then Gavin didn't want to have her be sick. He felt like the, the, that was sort of leaning on circumstance, which I agreed with. And then the next draft of the script, then Tess was sort of naggy um, for no reason. And then we all sat down and literally it was Gavin and Anthony and Joel and me in a room every day for a week for, you know, with a whiteboard. And we just went through every possible circumstance of the marriage and we talked about <clears throat> The good, the bad, you know, the highs, the lows. When we met, our first kiss. I, we, we, we talked through every detail of this marriage, and then tried to figure out what it was that was keeping us from being able to agree on this. And I kept saying, you know, that scene in the bathroom where I realized that he's well, he tells me that he's been fighting instead of bouncing. I kept saying, you guys, I'm not mad that he's fighting. Mm -hmm. I'm mad that he lied to me. And it was really interesting because for them, they were like, oh, that's what women get mad about. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> like, I kind of felt like we were like having like a therapy session or something. Um, they were like, that never had occurred to them. They were like, oh, wow, okay. I said, I fell in love with him when he was a fighter. You yeah. know, like we met when he was a fighter. She has to be attracted to that part of him that has to turn her on in some way. So it can't be that she's mad that he's fighting. It has to be that there are circumstances in their life now that make it not okay anymore. And that what's upsetting in that moment is the foundation of our marriage has been that we've always been honest with each other. And yeah. now you've threatened the foundation of our relationship by lying to me. So when, when we kind of got to that place, when it started, for, when that became the beginning of finding that conflict, um, then it was that we now, the, di the thing that was different was that we had children and that um, y you know, we, we had agreed on certain things that we weren't going to raise our children in a family where a father gets beat up for a living. Um, we'd agreed that we weren't going to be putting him in situations where he could end up paralyzed or in the back of an ambulance and that we were going to be risking those things now that children were involved. So, um, so that I think by really building it from the ground up with all the details of the marriage and of the relationship and, and being able to have the time to have those discussions all together, um, it was so wonderful because I didn't have to be afraid of those pitfalls when we were on set. I could just be on set and sort of just live the marriage with Joel um, and know that we had all of those ideas in common with each other and, and it felt like shared memories instead of, I have my ideas and you have your ideas and we hope they line up, you know? It's typical of Gavin, what she just discussed. You, what you're seeing is just immense amount of work, mm -hmm. immense amount of work to get the background of the character and they worked hard, really hard. I mean, uh, and Frank too, but that's the way Gavin worked. I mean, and that day that you had the discussion about what the fight was really about, did all of their girlfriends and wives thank you <laughs> afterwards? Well, Gavin's now in a really healthy relationship, I think, so maybe, I don't know. There you go. <laughs> um, uh, this film has a terrific ensemble. It's, it's pretty much perfect from top to bottom. Uh, your two leading men, uh, Tom Hardy and Joel Edgerton, can't be here tonight because they're making 12 movies each right now. I know. Um, <laughs> but watching them, especially in this film, it's so exciting. You, you really feel like you're seeing a star being made in front of your eyes. Um, can you just sort of tell us about the experience of working with them? Excuse me? 
all of you. Yeah. Well, you know, it's funny you should say that because part of, uh, part of Lionsgate's criteria with Gavin was to find two guys that could be movie stars. And, you know, Hardy was on his way up. He had made Bronson already, and nobody knew who Joel Edgerton was. <clears throat> and this is, this is, you know, hats off to Gavin O'Connor, and this is, I think, where, as a director, he's brilliant because... He, wait, he saw every actor that you all probably have heard of many times and, you know, poo-pooed all of them. And this kid sent a tape from Australia, Australia, and Gavin said, fly him in, and flew him in, and worked with him for a couple of hours and said, that's, that's our guy. That guy can be a movie star. And, that, and, you know, there's not a lot of directors who, A, take the time to do that anymore or have the time, and, and that, that are willing to kind of lay it on the, he laid his reputation with this studio, with, with, with the town, on these two guys. You know, he fought to get Hardy in this movie. There was no Tom Hardy before this movie. It wasn't like, oh, Tom Hardy? He fought tooth and nail to get that kid in the movie. And they didn't want him, they, you know, there's no marquee value, so they, they wanted, they wanted guys that just, uh, I think he, I asked Gavin what 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 he was what problem he was having, and I think Gavin was almost asking the actors, "Would you get in the ring, you know, uh, and go around with somebody, you know, just wrestle?" And he was getting the majority of, "No, I don't do that kind of thing, you know. <laughs> I'm an actor, you know. I don't I don't wrestle." So, so he, he he was trying to find those guys that would do that. And uh, the movie star thing, boy, that's the first one I've heard of that. But he had to have that. You what, know? What's with the... Yeah, with the movie star quality. Yeah, that's, you yeah. know, they, you know, find me... Because he movies. had to get it by the studio, you yeah. know. He wasn't going to get any money for me, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm way too old, you know. <laughs> you know, it's about a quarter now, I think. I heard um, Tom Hardy basically showed up at his house and didn't leave for five days. Yeah, that's it's true. true. Yeah. It's true. Yeah, so actors and, also and like cut his hair, and, and, right? And at midnight, you know, didn't Gavin he, like, said, "Shave his head or something." He shaved in his LA? head, but you know, Gavin said, "Listen, when you get to LA, give me a call." And and so they, we you know they knew we knew Tom was coming, in, and it was midnight, and Gavin was about to go to bed. And there was a knock on his door, and Gavin and 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 uh, Nick lived way up yeah. in Malibu, and it was a knock on the door, and there was Tom Hardy, <laughs> and he was like. <laughs> You know, dude, I said, come, like, maybe during the day. <laughs> yeah, he says, yeah, yeah, you know, what, bro, you know, what, what do you think? I'll come in, we'll talk for a And he didn't leave for five days. <laughs> and that's the truth. Um, and you guys also got to spend a lot of time, obviously, working with Joel. Can you talk a little bit about that? I hate him. <laughs> oh, Joel's he's great. I mean, you know, he's, you know, as an actor, when you find a group of people who are, you know, are like-minded about the work and, and are willing to kind of, you know, take a piece and tear it apart and, you know, and, and go real deep into it and put it back together, that's what these guys do. And I think, you know, just to add on to what Nick said, I think that, you know, culturally in, in Australia and in London, you know, these guys are all part, you know, they come out of drama school and, they, and they're part of, you know, rep and... and they're very well trained guys, and you know the, the the method, their methods of of working and, and preparing. Of you know, I think we all had the same thing. Yeah. And so when I met Joel and he found out I was in New Mexico, he told, asked Gavin to send him down with me, and he came down. And I, you know, I really, uh, I mean, I'm a married guy, but I really fell in love with him. I did. We we and, you know, Jan will tell you, we were together 24 so we. We lived. They were baking each other cakes. Yeah, I mean, we. What? <laughs> literally? We, we, and Tommy literally. too. Literally. Yeah, literally. I baked. Tom was sad one day and I baked him a cake. Aww. I mean, I have three kids, so I felt, you know, I know how to bake cakes and I baked him a cake. <laughs> no, but, and, and, and again, a testament to Gavin O'Connor because he put us together in, a, in an apartment building. We lived together. After work, we came and talked about the next day's work. And it's, you know, that to make something the quality that you, you, you see on the screen. It, it's not an accident, you know. It's that a was lot the of insane house. Do you all live together? Not me. <laughs> <laughs> well, he wasn't invited. <laughs> I, I'd come over and look at these guys. They were just absolutely crazy. You know, so it's just the way, you know, they were so far into it, you know. Uh, and that's where you get with working with Gavin. Yeah. I, I don't think it'd work any other way. No. Uh, it's impossible for him to work any other way. Which is why it takes his films 
I th uh, when I did Pride and Glory, it took two and a half years for it to come out. It almost didn't come out because he, he, he refuses to let the film go. He doesn't want it to give it back. And this, this film, too, he, he fought tooth and nail because, you know, it just has to every frame. There's no, not a pedestrian moment in the, in the film. Every, everything is connected to something, and it's very crucial. And, get, you know, the, the Lionsgate had to threaten to take him off the movie to get the movie, you know, so because he's so impassioned by, by it all. It's a good film for directors. I mean, you know, when, when you can take all of that difference and then make it smoothly work into one kind of long beat and head towards the same door, you know, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty interesting. And, and to have scenes like principal and kids, you know, how are you going to make that real? I mean, you know, it's, it's a really cliched kind of yeah. situation, but uh, uh, I mean, the principal is actually on luck. He plays one of the deviants. Oh, your new show? Yeah. On and, uh, and, HBO in yeah. January as well. Yeah. Well, he's, he's on that. I never recognized him from Warrior. Oh, really? Yeah, that did a whole, <laughs> whole season of luck, and then I'm uh, screening a uh, warrior, and, and I go come out of the warrior, and there he is. <laughs> And then I recognize, oh, he's the principal, too. <laughs> he's a good actor. He's just a good actor. <laughs> um, I'm curious, because we do have an audience of actors here tonight, and this is a SAG event. Uh, can you guys tell us how you got your SAG card? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I can tell. Uh, let's see. I was doing theater in, in Phoenix, and there was um, a casting director that would come to the theater and uh, whenever he was in town and uh, he would cast me, you know, he, he would watch the shows and I was in this repertory company and he cast me in Electric Light and Blue and The Riot with Gene Hackman and <laughs> Electric Light and Blue, I provided all the motorcycles for it and all that stuff. I, I had a little commune I was living in, you know, a nice Arizona desert place, you know. So, you know, that, that's how I got my card. You know. I'd always ask him after one of those things, do you think it's time to come to Hollywood? And he'd just go mum. So I figured that was the way to go to come to here. <laughs> but I had lived here in the early 60s, you know, so. You already had a taste of it. Yeah, 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 yeah. You guys? <laughs> I, uh, no, I, I started really young, and I, uh, I think I was Taft Hartley on a Beanie Weenie commercial. And, and then I think I was SAG on a Rice Krispies commercial when I was 10. Wow, you had an early start. Yeah, yeah well, mine also was through. I, I did a, a, a bunch of commercials early on in college and, and got my SAG card. Where, where at, Frank? What's that? Where at? I, I went New to, York? I went to New York. I went to NYU, yeah, but I, yeah. I, I was doing commercials and stuff. It, it seemed like a good... I never really thought acting would ever pan out. Yeah. Uh, and it hasn't. <laughs> <laughs> Um, every actor is very familiar with it. Is it something you mind doing? And, and would you mind sharing your worst audition story with us? They're all bad. <laughs> no, you know, it's funny because uh, it's great when you get to a place, uh, I'm sure you'll attest to this, I mean, I don't think Nick's auditioned in 40 years, but it's great you start to do some stuff and you, and, and you don't have to audition. And, and, you know, it comes down to a meeting. You have a meeting. And, and lately, it's been Skype meetings with directors. Yes, I've been doing so a lot of that. So I'm in my bedroom, and, you know, my kids are, and there's, you know, uh, Chris McQuarrie is on the thing. And, you, you, and if you don't get the job, you're like, man, I, I wish I could have auditioned for that. <laughs> Maybe if I auditioned, because I'm, I'm not that interesting of a person to talk to in my bedroom through Skype. So, you know, I used to be uh, terribly afraid of it, like everybody else. Cause Are you just Skyping it now? Yeah. You audition Skype, like Skype? Not yeah. even, well, yeah. Well, just meet, well, just you meet like on chit -chat. Skype. But you used to think, wow, if I only didn't have to do this. But, you know, it's just a, uh, now that I look at it, it's like just such a great way to act. It's such a great, yeah. if you don't put any weight on it, like you actually are going to get the job, because usually you don't. Yeah. It's a great way to kind of, you know, break down the character and kind of do your work and go in there and, and knock the shit out of it. And if you don't do great, they remember you. You know, they, they remember that you didn't do great. But if you do and you don't get the job, they remember you. And, and That's you know, a good point. That's true. It, you, they, I, so many times you get called back and, and uh, it's a tough thing auditioning, but... but yeah, I, 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 go ahead. Huh? Okay. You sure? <laughs> <laughs> you sure? <laughs> 
I know, I was going to say, I, I remember uh, when I first came out to L.A., especially with pilot season, it used to be way, way, way crazier than it is now because there were so many pilots. I mean, it used to be, mm. I, I used to be able to go on four or five, six meetings in a day, and, and it was every day. And it was, I used to have clothes piled in the back of the car, and I was changing while I was driving, and I had my damn Thomas guide out, and I was always lost, and it was terrible. Um, but... Uh, you know, it, and it was overwhelming because you start to feel like, you know, at the time I hadn't done very much work and not a lot of people knew who I was and everything was almost but no, almost but no. And you'd go, you know, I'd be in four or five times or something. I There was a year I tested for 12 pilots and didn't get any of them. Just to go through the tr test process 12 times is insane. Um, and I just got to a point where I was like, I have to love acting so much that I'm excited to go into each room and I don't care what happens or I should stop. So that for me was a big turning point. Like when I, when I really got to a place where I, instead of being so worried about the outcome and so worried about trying to get it, then I, had, I started looking at each audition as an opportunity to play that character that day. And then I was walking in the room with the intention of as if we were filming the scene for that day. And, and to just enjoy it for as long as that moment lasted and to walk away from it and not call my agent and not worry about it and not look for the feedback and not search to have my ego fed of however that was supposedly going and just know I got to be that act, I got to play that character that day. And I, I feel like that was a big turning point in, in my life, you know, I mean, not just as an actor, but just in my life. And, and it just, uh, you have to genuinely be in that place, but if you can genuinely enjoy it from that perspective, then... Um, you won't drive yourself as crazy, you know. And she's just talking about the, the, when you find out what you really love to do. And if you find out you really love to be on stage or act, then you found your life work. Yeah. And then, then it's a different story. Then, it's, uh, then you want to do the things you want to do when you need to do them. And I always felt that it was really important to chase the authors that that I needed to be connected with and needed to play the roles at the age where I, you know, when I should play them and not go to New York and, and, and hope to get an off-Broadway play or something like this or LA and sit around and study and all this kind of thing. I, I just, so I just went and I had a, a whole circuit that I would run. I, the little theater of the Rockies in Greeley, Colorado, I worked as a guest artist, and I got to pick one play to do, and then I'd have to be in all these other plays. And then, if uh, and then we had repertory companies, you know, and it would they'd last two or three years and 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 go down. But it, so you know, I did that for 14 years, and I didn't think about L.A. And I, with a little abrupt thing in, in New York where I went in to do a commercial for Prestone Antifreeze and ended up, because Grotowski had a workshop at the La Mama, and I ended up in his workshop, and then he ended up asking me to be in the play and then the lead of the play, and, it's, and I had to be in a baby diaper. And so, what play was this? <laughs> uh, I don't remember the name of it. It's uh, something like Spoken Words uh, by Joel Perry from Portugal. Uh, it was it a was nightmare. I mean, it's the only time I missed a curtain. Uh, I just slept through the curtain. And when I realized that, you know, I was 20 minutes late, and I got there, they were holding it, but they weren't happy. <laughs> You know, my, and, uh, you know, so I, I didn't want to stay around in New York and do that baby diaper deal again. <laughs> so I just went back out on the road, you know. And finally, it was William Inge saw me in a play in Phoenix. And he brought the play over here to L.A. Uh, to Contempo Furniture Store. And IFA at the time were his agency. And they tried to recast it with... Hollywood television actors, and he Bill fired them all, and uh, and we put on that show, and it it ran for about eight months, and then, so it was like an invitation, then you know, so it was an easy way in rather than coming in and going going around. But I remember those when the pilot season would be on. Yeah, it was nuts. It was really nuts. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And when Peter and Strauss and I auditioned for Rich Man Poor Man, I knew we had gotten it. And as we left, I said, I, I'll see you when we start shooting. He said, oh, you don't know that. I said, yes, I do. He said, no, you don't know that. And I said, yes, I do. 
How's he doing? Now, I may have been bullshitting him, but I did know it. I, yeah. I did, and I said it. And, uh, and I, she showed up the first day, which was really kind of a fun deal, that rich man, poor man. Yeah. yeah it was just on recently, as a matter of fact. Yeah. Um, it's great to see how far you've come since then. Mm -hmm. And I want to thank both of you, all of you, actually, for being here tonight. You guys are sure. all wonderful in the film. It's a beautiful movie. Thank you. Thank you guys for being such a great audience. <laughs>